This is my first major exhibition in Los Angeles, and it's with Edward Chella Art and Architecture. And this show, Intimacies, um, Transpositions of the Poetry of Pablo Neruda, debuted in New York City at the Queen Sophia Spanish Institute in 2009. And this is the West Coast debut of this body of work. Edward Chella used to have a gallery in Santa Barbara, and before that he was um, associated with other galleries, mm -hmm. and um, so I've known him, and he's known my work for many years now, and I, I've had, the major exhibition that I had before this in Los Angeles was at UCLA Fowler Museum, and it was a collaboration with my daughter, Sienna, who had written these poems, these sonnets about the sacred geography of the Himalaya and Tibet, and my husband, Macduff Emerton, who supplied the panoramic photographs that illustrated the places that she wrote about. And I did a handmade artist book and some large paintings, all based on a travel excursion that we had with my daughter when, um, when she was just 19, going for the first time to Tibet, to Nepal. And the exhibit at the Fowler, Monty Wall was um, in conjunction with an exhibit called The Missing Peace, artist's portrait of the Dalai Lama. And that was in 2006. When I was first painting, I was an undergraduate and pregnant with her, so I was I had her at a very young age. Um, and I was painting in the Southwest and the desert varnish sort of um, stains that leach out of the landscape gave her her name, Sienna, Color of the Earth. And that merging of landscape and landform and color um, has really informed work and my imagery ever since. And Sienna taught me discipline because when I was in graduate school, I was basically doing my work during the half time. So it was like, I have 45 minutes or I have an hour and I, to this day, I can focus, hunker down and get to work in a very short time. And I attribute that to going through graduate school with a toddler. <laughs> you uh, had a mentor uh, in the uh, you know, when, when you went to school, uh, what was that experience like having someone, you know, that you could work with and bounce things off of or learn from, you know, you know that was, um, I imagine it to be a very nurturing uh, environment for, you know, for someone, you know, for an artist. What, what was your experience? It was terrific. I was um, an undergraduate at College of Creative Studies at UC Santa Barbara, and that was a college within a college in which there were professional artists and musicians and writers, the New York City Ballet, um, pianist, the writer Eric Hoffer, um, many, many pa painters, um, Alice Baker, Paul Warner, Masami Kenamitsu, all came through and, and we worked with them. So there was a very intimate relationship in which it was reinforced over and again that art is made by people, real people that you can talk to and approach. And then when I um, applied for graduate school, I looked at Santa Barbara from a practical reason. I had, at that point, a two-year-old, and um, I needed a studio. And uh, I was given so much more because I worked with a man named William Dole. Mm -hmm. And William Dole is known for his beautiful, exquisite work in collage. And we didn't talk about art or, I mean, I find there's these days a lot of talk about how am I going to make it, how am I going to gallery, how am I going to get noticed, all of this peripheral stuff, which to me has nothing to do with the soul of why you're doing it in the first place. And uh, Mr. Dole and I would talk about anything from music to jazz to art to color. Um, and it was a very rewarding experience. And at that time, in graduate, school at UC Santa Barbara, he insisted that I have someone in the art history department be on my committee. So it was the mentor and then three people on the committee. And uh, I think it's important to have a sense of art history and know what came before you if you're going to be working in, as a professional in, in the arts. And uh, lamentably, that's not um, happening as much as I think it should. I've been working for 35 years in the arts, and so you have to ride the wave. I mean, sometimes it's really down, like in the end of the 80s, or we're just coming out of a really low period now. 
you have to ride that wave. And you can't always look for outside recognition as a way of evaluating who you are as an artist. And I was very fortunate in, in the beginning um, to have the attention of a, of a wonderful woman named Peggy Walker in the Bay Area who um, saw my work at a rental gallery in Santa Barbara, rental gallery is very famous, and uh, called on me. And I sent her work and she called me back, and I didn't know what to do. I had no sense of professionalism. You know, I had a baby on my hip and I'm stirring chili carne, and she calls and says, send me some more work, I've sold that. I put a couple little collages in an envelope and sent it off. You know, she goes, well, I took the liberty of putting prices on it. I mean, I was really green. I knew nothing. And um, it was just one of those very fortunate accidents that I fell into the lap of such a nurturing, lovely woman. And she then put me in touch with other collectors in the Bay Area. And so at that point, my work sort of took off, and I had several gallery shows in the San Francisco area. And a lot of that work is now, most of that work is now in, in private corporate collections. So, so you ride it. Sometimes it, it's up there, and then other times you can't you can't do diddly, but um, you still have to keep evolving and focusing and believing in yourself, and, and sometimes that's hard. I've been working ever since I can remember. I remember my mom giving me um, finger paints and crayons in a high chair. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really have a memory of that. And in a way, I've been finger painting ever since. A lot of these paintings, I work with my hands as my primary tool. I work with pigments and, and almost create the paint with binder and pigment on the surface of, of, of the paper. When I was really young, two, I was bitten by a mosquito carrying some strain of encephalitis and my eye crossed it. And I had a couple operations and then had what's called a lazy eye where mm. I put a patch in my eye and all this oh stuff. My. And they say sometimes it's from your your fault or your handicap that something <laughs> comes to be. And I don't have very well developed depth perception, but I can see pattern really well. And I really think that that affects how I do my work. And so who knows? But I, I think that... That's yeah, so interesting. You're, you're the second artist that I interviewed that has a depth perception. <laughs> Poor shallow people. Dominique Modi, I, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's a, a German-born uh, African-American artist. Mm -hmm. And she has that depth perception problem that she developed actually late in life. Uh -huh. But she does fantastic work. And I totally believe that, that you know, sometimes when you do have that handicap yeah. that limits you, you want to, you know, just make up for it in other ways and you, you, you aggressively, you know, um, go after things that you might have coasted with. Yes, or that other people take for granted and that you don't because you don't see it. Like for example, all my drawings would sort of go off to the right, so I would turn them upside down to correct them. So these exercises, that there was a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain that came out I remember many it. years ago. I've been doing that since I was a kid, just so I wouldn't be laughed at. would correct my drawings by turning them upside down. And to this day, I work on the floor, and I work from all four sides of the surface, not even deciding which way is up um, until the painting's quite a bit advanced. Does music play a role in, in your process of making art today? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, I listen to music often. In fact, I, you know, certainly love Tom Schnabel's show, you know, KCRW, because he's always playing really cool stuff. Um, or I listen to some of these classical music.